climate change has a range of impacts on our communities, such as rising sea level. We have uh, more intense and severe cyclones or climate-induced events that we did not create in the region. This is created by large emitting countries, and we are in the front line, you know, experiencing the losses that have been incurred as a result of climate inaction. So for East Africa, for example, what we've seen over the last 20 years is periods of prolonged drought and very intense rainfall happening as well. And this is how we started thinking about loss and damage fund, which can help countries who are already being impacted by climate change. They don't have enough resources to prepare and to respond to these impacts. Cut matters because well, it's the conference of the parties. It's 200 countries coming together. And it's not a small thing we're coming together. We have to try and avoid runaway climate change, crossing over one of the tipping points, which would see devastating results. So I always think going to it, this is the most important negotiations in history. COP provides the space to discuss and say, how do we help countries that are vulnerable and actually have less responsibility? For me as a scientist, it's really a platform and, and an opportunity to use my science to make sure that it's actually informing decisions that are being made under COP. Now, world leaders are addressing the COP27 summit in Egypt today as they try to rally global support for tackling climate change. There was a recognition, particularly from developing countries, particularly from the most vulnerable countries, that the damage is already happening. Pakistan, just I think three, six months before the uh, negotiations, had suffered an incredibly dramatic flood event. Well, we have to begin with the flooding in Pakistan. 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 The recent floods in Pakistan claimed more than 1,500 lives, and the government estimates losses of around $30 billion. It was an unprecedented flooding, and the devastation was so high that it impacted almost one-third of the country's geographical area. There were tens of millions of people who were displaced. I was a part of the attribution study, which was first of its kind over Pakistan. So World with Attribution is an initiative based at Imperial College London that looks at extreme events across the planet, trying to understand how extreme weather or extreme events are changing in their frequency and intensities due to climate change. Over 90% of our studies, we've seen a very clear role of climate change in increasing the frequencies and the intensities of extreme events. It showed that the intensity of that particular rainfall it was 75% more than it would have been in the pre-industrial world. So the study played a very important role uh, in shaping the uh, global negotiation uh, around loss and damage. Only come to Sham al Sikh if you are ready to agree to a loss and damage mechanism in addition to a post-2025 financing framework. The developing countries were going into the negotiations, in my memory, with the determination that there would be a fund agreed and start to be established. Um, that wasn't certain from the outset. In fact, there was a lot of opposition, I think, from a lot of developed countries. Not so much against the principle, but uh, I suppose looking to make sure that something that would be effective, that would be affordable in the sense that we'd be able to raise the funding. So it was deeply contentious. It was not agreed. One of the sticky issues actually was countries in the global north who we are considered more responsible for the warming of the system, saying that maybe there are impacts that are experienced from disasters that are not really linked to the warming of the climate. Maybe it's about poor governance. Maybe it's about poor infrastructure. So science is very foundational. I mean, and, and, and attribution science for this particular case played a very, very crucial role. You could have like countries like the small island states, you have the least developing countries. They were coming with very concrete information and data about how extreme weather is affecting their economies and their livelihoods and their lives. Given that it was a year full of disasters, the push for the agenda point was strong, but there was also significant opposition from the developed countries. There was a very late shift in the EU position, which uh, pressured other developed countries, rather, to follow suit. We are ready to address loss and damage because too many countries cannot shoulder the climate crisis on their own. We made a decision, the European Union, on our own, that we were going to agree to the principle of the fund. 
And we didn't do that in collaboration at the time, or, or we gave very short notice, I think, to the likes of the US, UK, Australian, Japanese, or other governments who we'd often be very much aligned with. That, I remember at the time, was quite dramatic. There was literally a scrum. You know, we were standing behind Franz Timmermans, there must be 300 journalists, cameras clicking in front of you. We need to move forward, not back. And that was a strategic decision. We felt, no, we, we do have to break the deadlock. But once you made the breakthrough and there's momentum, it was so much easier. This is 30 years of our hard work, right? 30 years of our advocacy. So we pushed very hard for the establishment of the fund with the intention to also ensure that the fund would become an operating entity under a financial mechanism. As a minister, and I was there representing, particularly the last four cops, you're coming in at the last minute. You're there to try and close the deal. You're four in the morning. It's kind of make or break and always inevitably chaotic slightly. But that's how you get 200 countries to agree something. Ireland, we're a small island ourselves. And towards the close of those negotiations, we were involved in changing the text at the last minute. All along we'd said there has to be an agreement that the fund will particularly be targeted towards the most vulnerable countries. Because most climate funds before that date hadn't gone to the ones who had been hit most, least able to draw it down. And that text was taken out on the second last draft, and that's where we came in. We were very involved in saying, no, that's not, with support of some of the smaller island states and other most vulnerable countries. And the very last minute that check was changed to say it would uh, target support. And that was something I'm probably proudest of, of anything I've done in politics, to make that a reality. Today, here in Sharm el-Sheikh, we established the first ever dedicated fund for loss and damage. It was very fulfilling because it made everything that I do make sense. I'm saying I'm doing science and this is one of the reasons I should continue doing science or one of the reasons I'm doing science and I'm really happy to see this go into policy. Personally, I felt very positive. Yes, some concessions were of course made in the final agreement, but overall we knew that we had made important progress uh, for climate justice. There needs to be a real change when it comes to understanding the scale of support that is required from this fund and how we can receive this fund uh, more comprehensively going forward given the geopolitical environment we are currently living in. After the fund was established in, in Egypt in at COP27, uh, it was operationalized the next year, the next COP, which happened in Dubai in 2023. At least now there's a structure in place that can support vulnerable countries' respond to losses and damages. But I think there's a lot that needs to happen. And it's really in terms of commitments, uh, making commitments and sticking by these commitments to put money into the fund to actually really help developing countries uh, address losses and damages. It needs more funding. It's not going to be in any way sufficient in scale to, unfortunately, the scale of damage that's coming to us. Climate has slipped down the international agenda for a variety of reasons, but the ability to still to negotiate progress in that, those difficult circumstances, in a world divided, in a world at war, that, I think, is one of the lessons that gives me hope that it's multilateralism is not dead. We are all at risk. We have common cause in addressing the problem. And even if every other aspect of international relations is in such disrepair and, dis and dispute, it's still possible for us in climate to protect all our own interests.